Our first speaker will be Daniela Reschnik, who is the Senior Research Fellow of the Development Strategy and Governance Division at IFPRI. I will not go into the details of the bio, they are all available online, so I invite you to read them all. But Danielle, you have the floor. Okay, well, thank you, Stineka, and good morning to all of you. Um, as the title of my presentation suggests, I'll be focusing on local governance to improve access to healthy foods. And when I'm talking about local governance, I basically mean policy formulation, oversight, investments, and or implementation that occurs at some subnational tier of government, whether provincial, state level, district council, ward level, some subnational tier. So why are local governments relevant in our discussion of access to healthy foods? Well, empirically, about 80% of the world's countries are decentralized to some degree, whether in the political, fiscal, and or the administrative domain. And the UN high-level panel on the post-2015 development agenda really emphasized um, in, their, in their documents leading up to the SDGs the importance of local authorities really being, as emphasized here, a vital bridge between national governments, communities, and citizens. And so they recognize this by elevating local governance in the SDGs. We now have, for example, SDG 11, which fosters the importance of inclusive cities and recognizes the role of cities um, in meeting our development objectives. And I think at a time when we are facing um, a lot of nationalism, populism, anti-globalist sentiment, um, we're really seeing cities kind of taking the charge in, in a lot of domains, um, particularly as the poster on the, the top right indicates, particularly with regards to climate change. Um, we've seen cities globally um, really taking the lead in addressing climate change mitigation, adaptation, but also um, the C40 initiative that was mentioned in the plenary this morning, um, really focusing now on how to develop kind of uh, healthy food system policies, particularly in urban areas. So what I want to talk about um, for, the, for the next eight minutes or so um, is just three areas where local governments are important. Um, one is with regards to agricultural production. The second is with regard to food trade in informal or wet markets. And the third is with regards to food safety. So I'm trying to kind of look at different entry points throughout um, the value chain or the food system. And I want to first kind of start on the farm and talk about agricultural production because when we, we talk about local government, it does tend to sometimes become equated with cities and urban governance. And I don't want us to just talk about cities and urban governance. And it's important to also look at governance in, in rural areas as well. And so um, we're, we're witnessing actually a devolution revolution, as I like to call it, um, where a number of countries have actually devolved agricultural policy planning, budgeting, to locally elected, and that's very important, locally elected governments. Um, so we've seen a number of countries, some listed here, that have recently changed or amended their constitutions to devolve functions to the subnational level. And when we think about what is the role for local government with regards to agricultural production, we know that theoretically there's a lot of discussion about how local governments are better informed of local citizen priorities. They can better target interventions um, to uh, particular agroecological zones, um, particularly when we're talking about agricultural extension policies. What we found in some of our, our work on this topic um, is that there are certainly some challenges, and we need to be aware of these challenges. One is we're finding uh, politician bureaucratic conflicts. So locally elected politicians may be more interested in building visible things, building health clinics, building schools, um, and maybe not as interested in agricultural extension services, which are less visible to voters. Um, so in Ghana, for example, where we've, we've been looking at this process over the last five years since they implemented their devolution reform, we've seen kind of insufficient um, budgets for um, agricultural bureaucrats, particularly those who work on ag extension services. So the kind of top right-hand diagram is just a snapshot of how we still have kind of an urban bias in agricultural extension staff in Ghana five years after devolution. Um, most ag extension staff are in areas where you actually have fewer agricultural households. Another issue we have with devolution is that it's supposed to give local governments more fiscal autonomy. Um, in many cases, they're able to raise their own taxes. And so what we've seen in places in East Africa in particular, 
um, is that you see local government authorities now using produce cess or crop cess, um, a type of tax on different agricultural products in order to raise local government revenue. So I've just given a snapshot on the lower right hand side of the maximum rates that are applied on different crops in Kenya and Tanzania. The problem here is, like in Kenya, for example, you have different tax rates on different crops across the, the country's uh, counties. Um, and so if you're a trader who's buying your maize in one county, you're drying it um, and packaging it in a different county, and then you're selling it um, in Nairobi, um, you're facing taxation at three different points. Um, so it seemed to be a real disincentive for, for both producers and, and for traders along the value chain. So what do we do in terms of policy options to address some of these bottlenecks? One is with regards to these kind of produce um, uh, cess that I'm talking about, is one is to certainly make sure that the kind of margins or the bands through which uh, counties or local governments can charge these rates is narrowed quite a bit. Another is for particularly extension staff, is finding human resource incentives to entice um, workers to more, more remote districts. And from some work we've done in Nepal, we've even found that where you have very few extension officers to begin with, just reducing the frequency of rotation um, can really help improve the quality of extension service delivery. Now, moving along to kind of more, more urban areas and where we talk about um, informal or wet markets, here, this is a really important area for local governance um, because often markets are a local government responsibility and often an exclusive responsibility of local governments. Um, we know from some of the presentations earlier today that these markets can be a really important source of food for the urban poor. And I think also importantly, a really important source of revenue for urban governments. So in Accra, Ghana, for example, these markets constitute about 10% of the city's revenue. And so local governments are key in providing um, clean water to traders, um, providing sanitation, providing drainage during the flood flooding season um, to avoid cholera outbreaks, um, and even just providing fire extinguishers because fires are actually a major, uh, major problem in many of these markets, destroying millions of merchandise, millions of dollars of merchandise overnight. Of course, one of our challenges is with regards to low capacity of local governments. Um, to provide these services. Um, we often have a problem of transparency in local government taxation, either caused through you know, some corrupt um, revenue officials at the local government, but also you have many different actors at the local level um, who may be trying to extort money from, from traders. We also have a problem of crackdowns on informal food traders that we see that flares up, particularly around high profile international events that come to a particular city. And we've had, we have seen that problem here in Bangkok as well. Some options that we see to overcome these problems, one is what's going on in Zambia. The Zambian Revenue Authority um, is actually rolling out mobile tax payments for informal food traders. So they pay their taxes um, through their mobile phones. Um, another, another option that's being pursued there is earma earmarking taxes for specific services so that food traders can actually see how their money is being reinvested in the markets for service delivery and hopefully increases trust in local government. And then if we turn to food safety, um, some work that's been done by ILRI um, has really stressed that food safety hazards are particularly pronounced in informal and wet markets. Um, and here local governments can provide a regulatory oversight role, uh, enforcement and providing hygiene training, food licensing. But one of our challenges is we often see a multiplicity of mandates um, across various government entities. So I've just given an example from Nigeria, um, from the city of MENA, where in MENA you have two local government area authorities, LGAs, each with uh, two different departments, Department of Health and the Revenue Department that have oversight to food safety. You also have at least five ministries and various agencies at the state level, the Niger state level, and then you have your federal level national entity in charge of food safety. Um, creates a lot of confusion over accountability um, among food vendors in particular about who is actually responsible for food safety. And once again, you do have a problem of low capacity to enforce things like food safety with not having sufficient environmental or health officers. So when we think about options, one obvious one is in terms of government's streamlining responsibilities. Do you really need eight um, entities providing oversight, or can you just reduce to two or three? 
Um, another where you have low, uh, few resources um, at, the, at the local government area is to particularly identify market leaders. And many of these markets have um, market chair people or product association leaders who could help monitor sanitation guidelines. And then developing scorecards about food safety hazards um, that could help identify some of the worst affected locations so that local governments can target scarce resources to those areas. So just to conclude, um, you know, I just want to reiterate that local governments are certainly pivotal partners for increasing access to healthy food. I think it's, it's really important for us to remember that local governments are heterogeneous entities, so we need to kind of nuance our recommendations, uh, whether we're talking about metropolitan areas versus peri-urban areas, um, and so on. Um, I also just want to make the point that w involving local governments is actually sometimes a very difficult task. Um, cities in, across the globe typically tend to be sites of political opposition, so we often see conflicts between national and local governments in terms of resource transfers. And in recent years, we've seen what I call recentralization by stealth um, by national governments, sometimes actually removing elected mayors and replacing them with appointed ones, sometimes launching large food subsidy or agricultural input subsidy or even national cash transfer programs, which uh, result in actually keeping money at the central level and reducing expenditures uh, at the local level. But nevertheless, I think local governments are probably best placed to pursue territorial rather than sector-based strategies to improve healthy food systems, targeting uh, food system strategies towards the local built environment, local land use planning regulations, um, and, and recognizing infrastructure deficiencies that are affecting the food system. And Johannesburg has been uh, one of the leaders in this area. And then finally, uh, local governments are probably the best place to create this kind of proximity to citizens through things like town hall meetings um, and creating deliberation on food-related public priorities. So I'll end there. Thank you so much.